Welcome to the Profitable Farmer Podcast, where it's all about increasing the profitability of your farm by working smarter, not harder. G'day and welcome once again to Profitable Farmer. Well, we're in the thick of winter. I hope it's treating you kindly and by now you've had a positive break. For those of you still in a dry spell, um, thoughts are with you and all the best over coming weeks. I do sincerely hope the season starts to genuinely play out for you. As I sit here, it is the 28th of June um, and we arrive to the end of a financial year. And I also sit here with my left arm in a sling having had a shoulder reconstruction. And ironically, it's given me a couple of weeks to stop and genuinely reflect and um, get some perspective on, as a business and a team, what Farm Owners Academy has achieved in the last 12 months. Um, And I must say that there's a lot for us to be proud of. And as we get through and into this discussion today, I'd like to share some of that with you not to boast or show off, but to demonstrate to you what can be achieved when the business principles that we believe deeply in and that we teach are well applied. In business coaching land, there's this construct that I love called congruency. And it's not a a word that we hear often, but congruency and being congruent is doing what it is you teach or practising what you preach or being an example for those around you by leading the way. And I I do believe deeply that the Farm Owners Academy, we we eat our own cooking. So everything that we teach to you and certainly to our clients through our Platinum Mastermind and other programs, um, we practice fully all of the principles, or we try to at least, and I'm really proud. And, and also, it is a proud day for me in that this is the first day of me in the managing director seat at Farm Owners Academy. So in order to achieve a freedom business or a freedom farm, what we ultimately need to do is set down an organisational chart, a structure of what the team needs to look like so that our business can work without us and ultimately and over a period sack ourselves out of every single box or function or role in that team structure or that org chart. And it's with that in mind that I... I'm delighted that I get to welcome Sam Johnson into our business as our new general manager. And we've been through a really interesting reorganization as a team, such that he now oversees day to day, week to week, month to month business management. And Greg and I now get to sit as the directors to the company and focus on a whole new set of imperatives. And so I'm not going to share all of this to show off. I'm sharing it to give you hopefully some direction and inspiration on the sequence to go through to build your business and your team out so that you can have a farm and a business that is ultimately under management and achieve a sense of freedom. I do love that construct of having a freedom farm, a farm that works for us, not us for it a farm with good structure and good systems and a kill, a killing team, a kick-ass team that can run the business whether you're there or not. And I'm delighted to share with you today that I guess as part of my reflections that I'm arriving into that for the first time and it does, it feels wonderful. The freedom and the time and space that I get to enjoy now so that I can focus on how we grow this project to the next level is wonderful. And ultimately, and certainly for our clients who are on this journey with us, this is what I want for you. So I hope you get to enjoy this, where I get to reflect on how it is that we've achieved that um, and also share with you, I guess, a little bit about where we're at 
some strategic planning we've done recently to set the foundations for where this project is off to. Again, to give you some insight as to what's possible for you in terms of your strategic plan. I also reflect on this podcast and what a privilege it's been to lead this over the last 18 months. We've had some really cool podcast themes around negotiation, around resilience, recently around burnout, time management, financial literacy, benchmarking, strategic planning, all things business and entrepreneurship, the art of really proactive and strong decision-making. We've had podcasts around people and the different personalities that we have to manage and lead in family and non-family business. We've had some amazing interviews over the last 12 months with Tony Catt around succession, with mate of mine, James Kelly, around aligning corporate teams, with my father on risk in agriculture, my brother on private equity and how they do strategy and growth at the big end of town, with David Charge in finance and banking, with Terry Tran on investing. Recently, ag tech with both Gaithan and Kalar, which I hope you enjoy. And then all things business, entrepreneurship and leadership applied through Danny Russell from everything to a cleaning company, to banking, to a John Deere dealership, to the meat and the meat sheep industry through Tom Bull, um, Cameron England, the wool industry, um, and Ricky Dummigan. And these principles applied in military and elite rugby. So it's been a wonderful journey and I look forward to the next 12 months. And I've actually got a request for you all is that I'd love for you to jump into our Profitable Farmer Facebook group or jump onto the Farm Owner Academy Facebook page and share with us what topics would you like for us to be exploring in this podcast over the next 12 months? And who do you have in your network who we might interview? And whose story do you think we should be sharing in order to serve and add value into the lives of all of our listeners? So if you've got some incredible legends of regional Australia or real leaders in agriculture or in business and entrepreneurship that you think would be wonderful to hear from and interview on this podcast, I'd love to hear from you. So please reach out to us with your thoughts and introductions. I really do appreciate it. And so just to speak to where we arrived to as a business, I think 18 months ago, we were a team of about seven, and now we're a team of 14. We have a dedicated marketing capability through Corey Top. We've got Adele, who many of you know, who's wonderful, now far more focused in our new structure on events and, and program delivery. I'm stepping into an HR space to support our team from an HR perspective. We've got Greg supported in our analytics department by both Sam Johnson and Tim Freak, which is amazing. We've got a really stra strong admin capability led by Michaela Maliki. We've got a coaching team that has expanded from three to seven, which is amazing with some incredible new recruits in Sam Pincott, Hayley Grosser, and Benita Bench to complement the amazing Tracy Seacombe, Cheryl Freak, David Westbrook, and Tim Freak as our coaches. Um, it's wonderful having that team building out. And as I said, now we get to celebrate Greg, Sam, Greg's son, Sam Johnson, leaving his highly successful corporate construction career to arrive into Farm Owners Academy to bring a whole new leadership framework and construct and to take, in, take on the general manager role. So it's been amazing to be part of that our business's growth journey over the last 12 to 18 months 
and to see it progress to where it is today. The foundations are really set to see Farm Owners Academy now consolidate for a little while and then really expand to the next level. The other thing we get to look forward to, which is one of my next priorities, is the establishment of a board of directors. And so I'm delighted that I get to invite, obviously, Greg Johnson, one of the founders of this business, and also Tracy Seacombe, our head coach, onto the board of advisors. And importantly, Andrew Roberts, who you all know as um, the other co-founder to Farm Owners Academy. As you know, Robbo's enjoyed 12 months sabbatical, focusing on his two young boys and his amazing family with Sonny, and has had some well-earned and well-deserved time um, just experiencing the freedom that we talk about ultimately. But Robbo steps back on and into this business as, uh, as one of as the fourth board of director members, which I'm delighted about. And so this business is only six years old. And if you think about it, it's gone from a standing start and an idea in both Greg and Robbo's head and a, a chance conversation and then some deep thought to a team of seven, 18 months ago, to now a team of 14. It's quite incredible. And I won't forget to mention John Gabriel, who's been with this project for the whole journey and with Robbo for a lot, a lot longer in the backgrounds working full-time for us in the Philippines on the digital and technical and um, behind the scenes systems infrastructure that supports and underpins our growth. So it's been an amazing journey. And here we are arriving into the new financial year with this business in the safe hands of Sam Johnson and with a board of directors shaping around it. And I guess it's with that in mind that I just want to transition in and share with you a little bit about the strategic planning that that team has been through recently so that we can set down now the foundations for reliable, predictable and sustainable growth over our next one, two, three and five years. And so to speak to our strategic plan, I'd like to start with a construct that Marshall Thurber taught, taught us or taught me and I guess the students that I've studied with through his programs about the ladder that businesses need to climb to avoid the price trap. And so stick with me on this, but who here in your business is stuck in a price trap? So as commodity producers, most of us are price takers. We take our bale of wool, our lambs, our cattle or our truckload of grain into the market and we get the price of the day. Sure, we can do some fancy futures and options and contracts to try and improve that price. But ultimately, as commodity producers, we are price takers. Now, there is a ladder to climb that I wanted to share with you today as to how you can move to be the opposite of that, where you're an absolute price setter. Now, some of our clients are making the choice to embark on the climbing of this ladder to get to a point where they can charge a true premium price for what it is that they produce. Most, though, are staying and committing that their business model is in the business of being a, a commodity producer. As you well know, if we're going to be a commodity producer and a price taker, then the mandate is that we must do it as efficiently as possible. So we need to be operating from an in 
you know, as low a cost base as we can and ideally having a strategy that has us scale so that we can be low margin, high volume and incredibly efficient in how our business arrives that product to the market with a consistent and reliable margin year on year. And so just to speak to this a little bit further, Marshall Thurber talks about bell, a barbell theory. And so if you think about a barbell that weightlifters use, where the weight is on either end and there is a long bar in the middle, he talks about needing to be at one of the two ends in terms of the business model that underpins our business. So at one end is exactly that. It is a large scale, low margin, high volume producer of a commodity. At the other end of the barbell is a five-star restaurant, like one that Jane and I got to enjoy recently, where we booked in and there was no menu you arrived and there were 80 seats and we got the meal that they wanted to cook that evening. And I think we, char- we, paid, we, we paid something like $200 a head for the meal with wine in addition. Now, but if you think about that, 80 seats, $200 a head, zero waste because there was no menu, and they had a waiting list of five weeks. Now, that is an amazing business. That business gets to set the menu and set the price and have predictable, reliable, and significant margin night on night. They've taken all the uncertainty out of their business. They can shape their roster. They can shape their cost base and everything to almost guarantee the margin that they're going to get every night that they choose to open the door with a waiting list and a premium price. Now, that restaurant is an example of the other end of the barbell where you are low volume, low scale, boutique, high margin, high end, high quality experience. So at one end of this barbell, we've got extreme efficiency. And at the other end, we've got extreme quality. What Marshall Thurbert has taught us is it's really important not to be in the middle because he describes that as ho-hum. That's neither. He says you've got to have a strategy that is pursuing either efficient commodity production or extreme high quality. But if you just reflect on the business that you have at the moment, which is it, which business model, which way of operating are you choosing? And then how strong is your strategy to achieve growth and scaling in whichever end of that barbell you choose to play on? I think it's a really helpful construct. You might not have the scale you need now, but you need to have a strategy around which you're going to achieve scale if you choose to stay a commodity producer. And at the other end of the spectrum, you've got to choose a business model that drives out waste, rem- takes you away from a three-star experience and really tracks you towards being a high-end, high-quality delivery deliverer of a six-star experience. And there are some wonderful examples of agri businesses and farming families that are absolutely in pursuit of that right end high quality high margin low volume business model which are you and so then just to dig a little deeper on this and to speak to the ladder that we need to move up if we want to move away from being stuck in a price trap and being only price takers, is at the bottom rung of that ladder, and you might like to write this down, we have commodity. In order to move up the ladder, the next level is to design a product 
that can land in a niche where there is a gap in the market. And I'll just use a, a crude example. I woke up after my operation the other day and I had this amazing male nurse looking after me for the day. And he was from Nepal. And we got chatting and he, on hearing that I had an involvement in agriculture, started speaking about the Nepalese farming constructs and he shared with me that there's 75,000 Nepalese in people in Sydney. So there is a significant Nepalese community and culture in Sydney. Now, the meat that they love to eat is buffalo. They, don't, they do eat lamb. They certainly don't eat beef. They don't like chicken. But they just cannot get buffalo. And I thought, gosh, there you go. There is a niche. How is it that he could or that someone perhaps in the tropics of Northern Australia could tap that niche and arrive a unique product into Sydney to a Nepalese butcher and fulfil the gap in the market for that Nepalese community? So that's the first ladder, rung of the ladder that can move you away from commodity is to find a niche market that you can provide a premium or a perceived premium product into. The next layer on that is to provide a service. So the third rung of the ladder is to provide a service. And I use the Bunnings example. It used to be that the hardware was just providing products to the market. And then Bunnings arrived into that market with a, a more unique service offering. And so in the same way that restaurant has created a unique service experience compared to most other restaurants, or in the same way that the Ritz-Carlton provides a six-star service where most um, hotels and motels provide a four-star service. If you think about your favourite restaurant or business in your local town or your local marketplace, their service is the thing that keeps you coming back. And so when you mash both product and service together, as Bunnings did when they entered the market, you present and provide a unique offer or a unique offering to the industry. CrossFit or um, any of these new gyms that are arriving to the market are arriving with an offer that is unique and different to what used to be the traditional gymnasium. And so that's the unique value proposition or the unique offer that is a mashup of both a unique product and a unique service arrived to a niche market. And so I think of Tom Bull and Lamb Pro and what he is, he is pioneering that we heard of in my podcast interview with him as an example of someone who is providing both a unique product and a unique service into the meat sheep sector and making a significant difference. So first rung of the ladder, commodity. Second rung of the ladder, product. Third rung of the ladder, service. Fourth rung of the ladder, offering, unique offering. Now, then, this, this is where most businesses stop. You know, this is where Bunnings has stopped. And I think, you know, businesses have to be careful stopping at this level because it might be okay. You might be able to achieve the price point that you want and, you know, achieve the market share that you want. But if you truly want to go to the next level and scale your business, the opportunity exists to climb the next few rungs of the ladder. 
The next rung of the ladder on top of unique offering is unique client experience. Now, this is where it is on steroids, where you book your car in to a mechanic and instantly get confirmation and a note in your diary. And then 48 hours beforehand, you get a text message or a phone call getting all of the details that are needed for the service, the specific requests and requirements that you have. And then if you happen to live in town, that this mechanic sends someone out to pick up your car and leave you with a hire car for the day. And then at the end of the day, when your car is serviced, payment happens automatically. There might be a recorded audio sent to you of the summary of all of the um, repairs done to your vehicle. And then your car's delivered by the mechanic with a full debrief. The car's cleaned every time, tyres pumped up every time, and a chocolate on the centre console with a date booked in for your next delivery. And if there's other things that they think of that your vehicle needs, some alternatives described on how you can get the windscreen fixed efficiently or whatever it is. Now, there is an opportunity. That's a crude example, but there is an opportunity in every industry to create a unique client experience that no one of your competitors offer. Now, you think about the accounting sector or you think about the pest control industry or you think about the building game. If you can nail a unique client experience, I mean, if only our accountants were more proactive with us and would proactively pick up the phone 12 times a year and just check in and make sure they're across how we're going or sit quietly in the background and analyse your numbers and ring with a few ideas on how you might move your business forward or minimise tax next year or find that investment property that might support your wealth creation strategy long term. If only our accountants would do that in a consistent and structured way. If only our builders would turn up on time and take their shoes off and take notes and be impeccable and deliver a well-priced, predictable rebuild of your home in a timely manner and to the highest of standards. So I raise that just because there is an opportunity like that restaurant with the fixed menu and the fixed price point to pioneer and innovate in every industry. And so, again, if you want to move away from being a product commodity, a commodity producer, then this is the ladders to climb. But when you get to unique client experience, you get to create something that is both different and better than anything else offered in your market or in the industry if you give it enough critical thought and enough creative thinking, strategy, but flowcharting and pioneering a unique client experience is when things really start to happen. This is when you get to put whatever price you want on the experience. Once it's systemized and you're able to deliver it time and again, this is when you start to create real value you start to genuinely drive your margins and you start to truly create something that has meaningful and lasting value. And this is when the cash can start to flow for you and you get to set down the foundations for a business that can be genuinely at the quality side of that barbell that I spoke about. So the next rung of the ladder is 
when you can promise the market those clients you're now delivering a unique client experience to a transformation where if they buy from you and have an experience with you that you can transform something for them. Now, for the builder, it might be transforming their home. For Michelle Bridges, it was 15 weeks on her program for a guaranteed or for an outcome that would transform your health and your wellness and your life. But once you can systemize and sequence a unique client experience and then look for how it can transform, if your marketing narrative can then shift to using that frame, that buy from us and over a certain time frame, we will transform your health, well-being, your home, your car, your genetics on your farm. For Danny Russell, in the cleaning space, it might be we, we will transform the cleanliness of your office premises. But once you're in the space where you can transform, then again, you get to lift your prices again because you're in a space in your market where you have no peers where what you do is transformational and it is unique. Now, the top rung of this ladder is where you can offer or almost put a, you put a guarantee around this ultimately that you can predictably transform, where it is a guarantee that if you buy from us, we will guarantee that if you follow our bouncing ball, you will get a unique experience, but you will. we can guarantee a transformation that is predictable. That is the top rung of the ladder where you avoid the price trap. You are a complete price setter and you get to deliver an extreme high quality at a really significant margin. And coming back, that is that. $200 meal by a chef's hat restaurant for 80 people with a menu that we had no say in. A predictably unique and a wonderfully special and even transformational experience, dining experience, such that I'm speaking about it now. And so... I think in agriculture, most of us will choose to stay as commodity producers. That is quite okay. But you've just got to go after efficiency, low-cost production, and ultimately and over time, real scale, and have a well-documented plan for that. At the other end of the spectrum, if you choose like a couple of our clients that come to mind in our cow and Sam Pincott and Pookie at Holbrook Paddock Eggs. And I think about my sister-in-law at the Long Track Pantry. And I think about Jane Boyce in Cooma in the fashions, online fashion space with Bird's Nest. There are so many examples of businesses that are choosing the quality end of the commodity production space and delivering something that can predictably transform at a price and at a margin that is your alternative business model to perhaps the commodity option that often we think we're completely, um, we have more options, I guess is what I'm saying. We don't have to only be a commodity producer. Now, you don't have to go all the way up the ladder. You can go halfway to offer a unique offer and sit there, and that's great. And you'll be able to claim a higher margin, perhaps, than 
um, producing only a commodity to the open market, or you can go the whole way, which, as I say, is what Michelle Bridges and so many others are doing, where they can offer a predictable transformation. So that's how we avoid the price trap. And I guess I was reflecting on the avoiding of the price trap construct when I reflected on the business model that underpins Farm Owners Academy. Because there are business degrees and there are ag colleges and there are TAFE courses that teach parts of what is on offer at Farm Owners Academy. You can learn negotiation by going and doing a course. You can learn personal development by going and doing a course. You can learn strategic planning by going to TAFE. You can learn how to do financial literacy really well and case studies on that by going to ag college. You can learn economics by going to and getting a university degree. You can learn leadership by attending a, a unique course. But nowhere do I, I can I see where it's all been put together and wrapped up in coaching and ed, a complete education sequence and a community and a client experience that is quite like what's on offer, I believe, at Farm Owners Academy. And what we're looking at now and my role now as MD is to explore some really important strategic questions now about how do we add more value to our community and our client base? How can we improve the client experience to a whole new level? And how can we reinvent and make minor tweaks to our offering and to our client experience such that if people just move through our program, that we can guarantee that it can predictably transform your business and your life. And if all the principles that we teach are well applied, that you can achieve whatever it is that is your definition of your freedom farm. Now, I actually think as a business that we are unique in this space and that we're very close. So I think we can promise transformation and I think we're very close to being able to promise a predictable transformation. And certainly what I hear and what I experience as I speak to our community and when I hear the stories of what's being achieved at our graduation ceremonies and through our coaching team, there is so much wonderful transformation happening that I think now with real focus that we can strengthen our offer so that we can predictably transform, which I'm excited about. And so I mentioned at the outset of this discussion the importance of being congruent and practising what you preach and that I'm proud of farm owners that we do our best to do that. And so for those that are watching this, I'm just going to share my screen, but for those of you listening to this only, that's okay. Over the last three months, we've done some really strong strategic planning using the clarity action plan method that we recommend to our clients. And we sat down to review all parts of this business and to set down a 10-year strategic roadmap for where we are off to. The first thing we did was to reflect on what we had already achieved, which was a wonderful process and such an important part of strategic planning. And then we set down, as per the book, Good to Great, by Jim Collins, which is a book that we advocate if you haven't read it already, to apply what he calls the hedgehog concept. Now, if you think about a hedgehog, they can, when under threat from a competitor, bunker down and put up their armour, their thistles or thorns in their coat and sit in the same spot and not be harmed by the threat that is coming their way. So he talks about businesses, if they go about their strategy well, 
being somewhat impervious to threat and, com and competition and challenge from the outside world. And in order to explore what it is that is your hedgehog concept, we are challenged to ask three important questions around the vision that we have for our business. And again, you might like to write these down. The first question is, what are we deeply passionate about? The second question is, what can be, we be the best in the world at? And the third question is, what drives our economic engine? And so our team has explored this thoroughly over the last three months. And we believe that we are deeply passionate about changing the lives and helping farming families realise their potential. We are deeply passionate about backing, the far backing farming families who we see as the true entrepreneurs of agriculture. Now, our response to these questions need to enrol and inspire both you and those around you. And so I put it to you, what is your answer to that question? You might like to pause this recording and get out a notebook and do some initial thinking on what is it that you are deeply passionate about as a family and as a farm team. The second question, what can we be best in the world at? Well, at farm owners, we think we can be the best in the world at entrepreneurial education, at coaching, and at community, at building a truly positive, engaged, committed, entrepreneurial community of like-minded peers all on a growth journey together. So we've come up with education plus coaching multiplied by community equals profound results for our clients and inspiring experiences. We believe that we can be the best in the world at that. And as I say, I think we're well on the way, which is so exciting. So again, what is it? that you can be best in the world at. Again, I encourage you to pause this interview and or conversation and to stop and reflect on that for you. Now, the third question required in order to explore your hedgehog concept is what drives your economic engine? Now, what Jim Collins talks about is that there's a whole lot of numbers that you could focus on as a business in order to drive performance and profitability. But ultimately, if you can focus your team and all around you on one key metric, that the growth in that metric drives everything, then that is the number that drives your economic engine. And so for the Ritz-Carlton, it's occupancy rate as it is for a mechanic or a gym it's, it's, or a hairdressing salon. It's, it's quality service and it's occupancy rate. Heads on beds for a hotel. And so for us, we want to create a growing movement of farming families completing our premier programs or a growing movement of freedom farmers completing their journey with us, whatever that is. If we can do that, then every other metric in our business will be fulfilled. And so once you've answered those three questions, the fourth question is through that to define what it is that is your big, hairy, audacious goal. Now, a lot of people think this is all a bit of fluff, but this level of clarity around your business's long-term strategic plan can be the thing that sets you apart and genuinely gets you in motion towards bigger and better and more significant results. 
But having a big, hairy, audacious goal is critical in the strategic planning process. And it needs to be big enough such that you've got no idea how it's going to be attained. But if it could, then you would be delighted beyond your wildest dreams. And so a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. And so ours is to help 10,000 plus farming families to be at their best in business, then change their industries within 10 years. So we've set down that goal of changing the lives positively of 10,000 plus farming families. And again, for me, that's enrolling and inspiring as I think it is for our team and those around us. There was one other question that we explored in depth, which is what is it that is our winning aspiration? And so in addition to your BHAG, what's your BHAG? What's your big, hairy, audacious goal? If it can be measurable, that's good. It doesn't have to be. But it's got to be significant and it has to be enrolling and inspiring. And it's through the setting of that that you can, and the answering of these questions, that you can arrive to the vision that you have for your, for your farm and your family and your business. Without this level of focus, you can have a very misaligned, unengaged and disparate team and family. But when these things all line up, every single one of the decisions we make now are in the context of the pursuit of these outcomes, which is just so important. And we know that clarity leads to power. And so it's in the answering of these questions that you get the focus and, and power kicks in for you. And your business model and your growth trajectory can become so much more resilient. And so our winning aspiration is leading a movement of farm-focused entrepreneurs and creating freedom farmers every time across Australia and beyond in time. It's been a wonderful process to explore our answers to these questions with our team. I do believe that it has helped us absolutely enrol and engage those on the journey with us. And I'm happy that the level of clarity that we have and that we feel as a team helps us set down the foundations for where we're off to. The other thing that we did in our strategic planning was got, we got really clear on where we need to be three years from now, where we need to be one year from now, and what priorities need to happen quarter on quarter for the next four quarters in order for us to make a significant step in that direction. So we're very clear now on what projects we need to focus on and complete on as a team quarter on quarter for the next four quarters. And as we've spoken about in my interview with David Westbrook a few, a few episodes ago, quarterly business planning has the ability to allow you to achieve seven times more in one year than you would by just setting down annual targets and having an annual plan. So looking at the seasons or looking at the quarters and planning your business in that way is really important. And absolutely, we've got our roadmap mapped for our key improvement projects quarter on quarter for the next 12 months. And then in this quarter and this Friday, we've got our quarterly planning session where key members of our team will come together for a whole day online this time thanks to COVID, and we will set down the action plan on each of the projects for the coming quarter. And we've got some really exciting stuff around how it is that we're going to add more value into our community, new products that we're pioneering. We're a way to implement on a systems overhaul 
to improve the platforms that support our online learning, our online training, and our coaching capability. And we've got a hat full of other projects that we will unpack and develop really clear and actionable plans around the implementation of each in this coming quarter. So the other important construct that we focused on as part of our strategic planning in recent months was we reviewed, as I said, everything in our business, including our core values. And interestingly, and it's often the case in other businesses that I work with, the goals, the vision, the strategic plan, the hedgehog concepts, all change and develop when you sit down to reset your strategic plan. But interestingly, our core values, when we reviewed them, stayed exactly the same. So at Farm Owners Academy, our core values are empathetic, innovative, passionate, challenging leaders. And when we looked at all the variations and um, improvements to those, we decided that they were perfect for this team and for the project that we lead. And so our core values stayed the same. But for me, that sets down that process, the context now for how we consolidate and then move forward as a business and an aligned team to create something that is unique and special in this marketplace. We've got our strategic plan squared away. We've given it the time and the energy it needs so that we can be proactive, composed and in control of where we move to and the value that we add to our community and to our clients. And so just a shout out to my team, Sam, Adele, Westy, Greg, Michaela, John, Tim, Cheryl, Tracy, Benita, Sam, Haley. I think I've got everyone, certainly Robbo. It's been a wonderful process to work through. I'm really proud of the team that I get to be part of. And it's wonderful to be able to share our strategic plan and how we've arrived to that as an example for those in our community to follow. And so for those listening, it is a process and it takes time. But I want to encourage you as a way in which to bring your family and your business team together to lock out the time you need, and we recommend two days for strategic planning and then one day every quarter for the quarterly planning and to make that discipline happen. And if you just follow the process of strategic planning and the process of annual planning that we recommend at farm owners, then over time you can be aligned you can be focused, you can have the clarity you need and you can move forward and take your business truly to the next level. So, guys, thank you in this conversation for humouring me as I reflect on where we've arrived to as a business, where I've arrived to in ultimately <laughs> sacking myself out of all the functions of our business so that I can be at a director level and focusing very strategically on how we take this business forward. How I share with you that Sam Johnson steps into our general manager seat and I look forward to interviewing him um, and for you to meet him and hear his genius um, as our new general manager and the foundations that we've set for our one, three, five and 10 years ahead. So, guys, I hope that's been valuable to you as an example of strategic planning applied to a growth business. I hope you enjoyed hearing about the steps that we need to move through if we want to move away from being a commodity producer 
towards de delivering something that can be quality and high margin. If that does interest you, post in our Facebook group questions if you need more um, clarity, but I hope that gives you a roadmap to explore moving forward if that's the journey that you'd like to embark on. And guys, importantly, thanks for listening and being part of our growing podcast and profitable farmer community. As I said at the outset, it's a huge privilege for me to be part of this, um, to be interviewing such amazing people and to be getting to hang out with you every fortnight and sharing what we know and learn and teach in our business around all things entrepreneurship, all things business, and all things personal development. Guys, I wish you well as you roll into the end of your financial year. Um, make the time to set down a strategic plan that is different and better than the one you've had so that the next 12 months and the next three years can be different and better than any years you've had so far in business. Thanks for your time. All the best and speak to you again in a couple of weeks. Bye for now.